And so now the EPC is trying to build this project using improved vendor list at the lowest possible cost, right? Because that's how they make their margin. No fault here. And so you have overly aggressive production assumptions coupled with someone who's trying to build the cheapest possible system. And you're, of course, going to have inherent issues. Hello and welcome to the Solar Maverick podcast, where solar meets entrepreneurship and experience. I'm your host, Benoit Thanjan. So let's get into it. Hi, this is Benoit, your host of the Solar Maverick Podcast. The podcast is brought to you by Renew Energy. We're a solar energy developer and consulting firm. Our website's www.reneuenergy.com. I'm excited to interview Brian Lynch. He's the director, solar plus storage at LG Electronics. He works with accomplished sales team to expand the market of LG's high efficiency and high quality PV modules made in Huntsville, Alabama and next generation energy storage system products. He has 18 years of experience in the solar industry, and he's worked in marketing, communications, business development, and policy research. He's been involved in hundreds of megawatts of solar energy that are generating clean energy around the world. There are a lot of interesting points that he makes on the podcast. Some of them is that LG did a Harris Poll survey where they asked residential customers who are looking to solar what they were looking for. Part of what they were looking for is like a premium product or brand awareness which helps LG because obviously LG is very well known in the electronics space and makes customers feel more comfortable about using their panels. He talks about lowering uh, customer acquisition costs for residential customers, how electrification is increasing the adoption of solar. And also I thought was very interesting was a study that basically said that solar is underproducing 10% of the time than from the initial expectations for the project. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Solar Maverick podcast. Thank you for listening. Let's get into it. Hi, this is Benoit, your host of the Solar Maverick podcast. I would like to thank Summit Ridge Energy for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Summit Ridge Energy is the leading owner and operator of community solar projects in the United States. Thank you again to Summit Ridge Energy for sponsoring this episode. You'll learn more about them during this podcast. Hi, this is Benoit, your host of the Solar Maverick Podcast. I'm really excited to have Brian Lynch on the podcast. He's the Director of Sales and Storage at LG Electronic, and he's also original OG. He's been in the solar industry for 20 years since you started your career. So it's amazing because I think you bring a lot of perspective. You've worked for a lot of different companies, and I'm excited to have you on the podcast, Brian. Thank you for making the time. Yeah, but always thanks for having me. Although please don't say I've been in the industry for 20 years because it's not quite 20 years. And I feel really old when people say that. So I'll accept the OG, but the 20 years, you got to wait two more for that. Sure. But 18 years is close enough. And honestly, like in the industry, <laughs> like 18 years is amazing if you think about it. And really, for sure, like seeing how the industry has changed over that time is pretty amazing. And all the ways I'm sure you had to adjust and recalibrate. Yeah, I, I say solar years are like dog years. So if we're going by that metric, I'm like 472. I, I think my favorite stat is I've been to every SPI since they graduated from CS offices. So going back to the mid 2000s, I was hoping at number 10, I'd get like a punch card and get a free coffee. It didn't happen. <laughs> well, maybe we could arrange that. We'll talk to Abby about that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> can you talk about, obviously everyone's very familiar about LG, but can you talk about your role at LG some more? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been with LG for just about three years. I'm a sales director, so I coordinate the sales activities across the U.S. I'm also deeply involved in the policy efforts at LG. Unfortunately, despite our best efforts as an industry, we are still very reliant on policy, whether it's incentives or tariffs. It's a day-to-day -day topic for us. And I do business development. So looking at different strategies and ways for LG to participate in a market that's heavily commoditized, that really leverages our brand equity and our high-quality products is really what keeps me up at night and is a very very fun challenge here. Yeah, definitely. That's really interesting. And it would be, obviously, as I mentioned before, everyone's familiar with LG, but how is LG involved in the solar business? It would be great to get a better understanding. Yeah, you're right. Everyone knows LG. You probably have an LG appliance in your home or a nice LG TV. But very few people, especially outside the industry, know that LG is in solar. And we're not a small player. We have 2.5 gigawatts of in-house manufacturing capacity on the module side, a little less than 2 gigawatts of in-house cell capacity. And what makes us unique is a couple of things. Our cell architecture is a IBC or back contacts so of very high efficiency, low degradation. And our core product is an N-type mono. 
end type is distinguished by a couple of things. It doesn't really suffer from lead induced degradation and it has a very low degradation curve. So if you're modeling a project that is high efficiency and is a high requirement for reliable power output, you know, end type is a great platform to look at. And we do manufacturing in house in Huntsville, Alabama, of all places. Wow. It's a little bit weird to say that, but we do have US manufacturing in Alabama and of course manufacturing in South Korea where LG is headquartered. That's pretty amazing to hear. And I know we talk about your 18 years of experience in renewables and solar. Can you talk about your background before you started working at LG? The the interesting trend line is I've always worked for original equipment manufacturers with the exception of a brief period where I had my own company that was doing inspection and repairs for underperforming systems. Uh, I've worked for an energy storage company and primarily for module manufacturers, but I haven't always just been selling modules. I've done project development and EPC work as part of manufacturers. So as manufacturers are constantly trying to move downstream, break down this commodity struggle they find themselves in, I was leading those teams and efforts uh, at a couple of companies. And so I've really sat on all sides of the table which makes me very, I think, understanding of the different requirements that every participant in a project has. And it really guides my philosophy of when I participate in a deal, I want everyone in the deal, I want everyone in the transaction to get something positive out of it, to have a good equitable stake. Because if one person is left holding the bag of a loss, the project is risky because there's a chance that they're going to default or try and change order, you know, whatever their role is. Everyone needs to make their fair share for a project to be success. And the good news is you can do that and structure it. You have a repeatable team that you can keep going back to do more deals. Definitely. That's really interesting. And I think it's a great point about how you have that diversity of experience within the industry so you could add more value to the clients. And it's interesting because when you talk about LG, you're doing sales and business development. But then it's interesting to me that you work on policy activities. But obviously, like that's so important to know because your clients want to be fully educated. How did that happen where you're getting involved in that aspect, which some people might think is different from your primary role? And it sounds like almost an entrepreneur in a sense, right? That you're doing a lot of different hats. That makes sense. Yeah, it's an interesting question. So it is very much entrepreneurial. And when I joined LG, honestly, my big fear is I'd be joining a global Fortune 200 company and I would be surrounded by bureaucracy of hundreds of thousands of people and systems and processes that wouldn't allow me to flex my business creativity or get involved in tangential things like trade. Now, I will say that LG is very large. It is somewhat bureaucratic, but they really empower individual employees to go beyond their job scope. Now, there is a policy team both in the US and Korea. They're doing the majority of their work is for like TVs and importation of washing machines. Solar is kind of like a really big, expensive hobby for LG. And so the fact that I'm very engaged with it, I have a bit of a background in it. I work very closely with them. And on most days, I think they're supportive of my ability to help them understand solar policy. So prior to joining the solar industry, my first job out of college was actually doing strategic communications at an agency up in Rochester, New York. And if you know anything about Rochester, their big employer was a company called Kodak. And this was about the time, because if you remember, I'm older than I'd like to admit, that Kodak looked in the mirror and said, uh oh, the whole film business is probably not a sustainable business for us. And Kodak laid off. I mean, every week it was like 10,000 people. It was insane. I got caught up in that. I moved from Rochester downstate. I worked for a company called Shot and was doing strategic communications. Shot is a multinational German company, also had a solar hobby, and they were manufacturing in Massachusetts. And as they were advocating for more support and policy support in the U.S. for renewable energy and solar, I became very involved in that. So I was chairing a committee for SIA and really learned the industry through the lens of policy. And when SHOT opened up a facility in Albuquerque, New Mexico, I joined the solar team full time in a business development capacity and then never left. Every time I think I'm out, they suck me back in. SHOT divested and I stayed in the industry and the rest is history. But that's the key thing as well, because the industry is about relationships. You've been in the industry for a long time and you've built you know, very strong relationships, I'm sure, through it. So, And then your knowledge and seeing the trends over time, being part of an OEM, I think you know, makes you different from you know, other people in business development and sales. Honestly, that's what I love about solar. People ask me, would you ever get out of the industry? And I don't think so because I joined at a really early state. So I've had this benefit of the history of solar and experiencing it firsthand. And solar is not going anywhere. Solar continues to be a growth industry. And I think the industry is really full of great people. You don't get in solar. I mean, we have our fair share of scallywags and knuckleheads, but they tend to work themselves out of the industry you know, pretty quickly. Thankfully, like Bitcoin mining is the thing I think that absorbed like half of them. But if you're in solar, I think at your core, you're trying to do it for positive reasons. Yeah, we're all out to make a buck. 
but we're doing it in a way that improves the way people live and work. I think we all sleep well at night because of that. And I think there's more good people in solar than maybe other industries. Definitely, I agree with everything you said, and that's great perspective. Going back to LG, can you talk about like the customer loyalty program that you have with residential installers? Yeah, so LG set up a program called LG Pro a couple of years ago, and this was a way for us to take our phenomenal brand equity and bring it to our local network of installers, or what we call now LG Pros. And it's a way to create this seamless consumer connection behind the idea of, I'm contracting with my local company in my local town. I don't know if I trust them. I don't know if I trust solar. And so LG Pro is a validating step to help consumers realize that this is a good company installing good technology and providing good service backed by a big company. Now, as an installer, if you're a small business owner, what does LG Pro actually offer? So we do a points-based system if you're a small installer. Those can be cashed in for LG appliances and TVs, tickets for sporting events, as those are are now starting to happen again, which is super exciting, uh, gift cards for travel. And so you can use those as promotions, you can use them as sales incentives, or you can use it just to put the appliance in your home. We don't question that. If you're a, a large installer or a large installer in a small market, right? So we do understand that if you're in like Des Moines, Iowa, you're not going to do the same volume as someone in San Diego. And so we adjust for that. So if you're a larger installer and more loyal to LG, instead of points, you can opt for a cashback rebate based on your volume. So we're actually putting money back into your bottom line, which we hope that you're using to fund marketing programs or more customer engagement tools. In addition to that, we have a full suite of behind the password protected website, you know, blog articles, co-branded content, a print on demand service. So you can print out proposal jackets or data sheets with your logo on it. Again, just tools and resources to help small business owners create a connection that they're part of a very large company that consumers know and trust, which we actually quantified a bit through work with Harrisville. Consumers really do like that LG brand on their proposals. Yeah, definitely. That's interesting because that's a natural progression to my next question. You talked about the Harris Poll briefly. And I thought the findings of the Harris Poll that LG conducted were really interesting. Can you talk more about that? That would be really helpful, Brian. Absolutely. It was almost actually a year ago that we commissioned Harris Poll. So Harris is an independent survey organization. I'm sure most people have heard of it. We started it in Q2, which if you remember Q2 2020, it was we were all staying on the beach watching the tidal wave of COVID come ashore, not knowing what was going to happen. And like every big company, LG said, ooh, we should cut our marketing budget because we don't know what's going to happen. And to LG's credit, they said, well, instead of just stopping advertisements and doing core market activities, we're going to invest in market insights and market knowledge. And we're going to use the remaining marketing budget very efficiently because we'll have this great consumer insight. And so we commissioned Harris Poll to talk to installers and a thousand consumers who had self-identified as either recently purchasing solar, so that was defined as within the last two years, or were in active consideration cycle for solar, which meant that they had gone so far as to either talk to a customer or excuse me, talk to an installer or were just doing research online. And the insights were really fantastic. A couple of key takeaways we learned from this, and there's been a lot of stuff written about this. So you know you can reach out to me and I'm, I'm happy to send you articles or even a summary presentation. What this really quantified is that there's no single solar customer. So it's very market variable. If you're in a market like California that is beyond early adoption, consumers thought about solar is different than, I'm going to say Des Moines, Iowa, again, because their solar is very much early adoption. And from there, you can really segment customers into two camps. You have those that are willing to spend more up front to get a better return on investment over the long term. And then you have those that want to just spend the least amount because it's the cheapest. Harris quantified that as a 70-30 split. 70% of residential solar customers are willing to spend more up front to get a better return on investment, and 30% just want the cheapest system. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to this, but the key takeaway here is if I'm a solar installer, I don't know that I always want to be competing on price. So maybe I cede that 30% to my competitor in town who's willing to make lower margin than me, and I'm selling that 70%. More importantly, though, I'm educating that customer on why they want to be that 70% and the value of that investment. And that was another key finding that we actually got out of the focus groups is consumers want to use solar as an investment. So reframing all these conversations as investments as opposed to cost really helps validate that the consumer wants to spend a premium for a premium product if you can justify that premium. And this is where LG, again, wins in a lot of ways. So we did some testing. We put generic proposals in front of customers. And in some instances, they were technically identical. So everything about it was the same. And one proposal was just a generic proposal with Solar Install LLC. And the other one was co-branded with LG. And we did price sensitivities. And what we found is consumers were willing to spend a significant premium for the exact same proposal that was co-branded with LG. And that's because you're taking something that they don't truly understand. For a lot of 
consumers, there's an element of magic being to solar, and you're validating it with a company that they know and trust, that they've had personal experiences with that are typically very positive. LG has a very high net promoter score. And so what this translated to is a direct benefit for the installer. LG sells products at a premium, but the installer, if done right, can pass that premium on to the consumer, and the consumer is very willing to pay for that. Yeah, that is very interesting. And especially as you know, Brian, how much competition there is as a panel manufacturer and how LG can differentiate from the competition. And then, you know, it was interesting as well to read the PUV magazine article that we'll share like a link on the notes of the podcast, which is basically a summary of, you know, what you just said. So that is really helpful. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> oh, anytime. It's interesting because you talked about proposals, co-branding with LG. You know, one of the major expenses for residential installers is customer acquisition. Can you talk about how companies can lower customer acquisition? Benoit, this is what keeps me up at night. I think about the inefficiencies of customer acquisition in solar probably more than is reasonably healthy. It's astounding to me that roughly a third of the cost for residential installation in the U.S. is driven by customer acquisition. And I really think that this comes down to the fact that the do-nothing option is so easy for customers. They know that going solar is the right thing. They know it's the better investment. But this idea of, well, I know my utility. I don't really like them, but I usually have power. And once a month, I get $200 sucked out of my bank account because I'm on auto pay. You know, I know I don't like that. I know there's a better way, but it's easy. It's easy to do that. And when customers make the step, make the mental leap to explore solar, we know through Harris, they, they talk to three installers who give them competing quotes. And what happens is, is those installers all bombard them with competing messages. Maybe one is selling a lease. Maybe one is selling a low-cost technology. Maybe one is doing something completely different or just offering LG. And that paralyzes customers because these are not small investments, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. And so the customer will then freeze again and say, well, I don't want to make the wrong decision. I should educate myself more and I'm going to keep buying power from the utility. And they then lose interest because, because they're afraid to make the wrong choice. So what LG did in response is, and again, this is really driven by the data from Harris Poll, is we set up what we call the concierge program. And this is a service that LG offers on our website. So if you're looking at our OLED TVs and you see solar on the ribbon prior to to COVID, if you click on solar and you put in the lead form, you would be directed to an LG Pro installer. And we still do that in some instances where we don't have coverage for the concierge program, but it was very, very inefficient. And when we tracked the consumer experience and when we tracked the flow through rate on sales, it was abysmal. Principle B2B marketing is a lead has a half-life, right? Every hour that you don't follow up on a lead, the value of that lead diminishes by 50%, all the way to the point of 24 hours. The lead is basically dead at that point. And there was an inherent, very slow process in the way we were handling it. And we said, hey, as LG, why don't we offer a service that can take this lead, handle it in a low-friction format, but not in a heavy sales perspective? That's what the concierge program is. The consumer goes on our website, they have interest in solar, they immediately get a high-level proposal that's generated using an automated algorithm to, again, engage their interest in this is used as a validating step. And if there's interest from the consumer, they then select a time to talk with the concierge. This is not high pressure. This is done on the consumer's schedule. So they're expecting the call. This isn't fill out a Facebook form and you get 4,000 people overseas calling you. And I've experimented with that. It's not pleasant for anybody. And then the first question that our concierge asks is, are you working with any installers today? If the customer self-identifies that they are working with an LG Pro contractor, we immediately get some market intelligence about why they're still shopping around. We flip it right back to that contractor. Because at our core, we don't want to compete with our installers for the same customer base. Now, if the consumer says they're not happy with that experience or they aren't working with anybody, then we'll take them through a full sales process to the point where we find a contractor in the back end. We actually contract on their behalf at a rate that the contractor has preset. So this is a value that they should accept. And from a consumer's perspective, it's fully LG branded. It's done virtually within the comfort of their home, very low pressure. And when we test this, consumers say they really like this process. It's a good referrals. And again, this is something that we offer to our LG Pro installers. And we think it's revolutionary in a lot of ways. We're also seeing now is an inflection point. That's yes, for customer acquisition. You have this organic demand for solar, but this is really driven by people working and educating at home over the past year. Their utility bills have gone up and they're saying, I really have to find a better way for this. I think solar is the answer. You also have EVs entering the picture. 
more and more auto manufacturers are rolling out EV platforms. And this is now changing this idea of solar being an accessory to the single family home to solar being a mandate. More and more consumers are going to realize that the only answer for their energy solution going forward is solar on the roof if they have a viable roof. And I think this is going to be the most transformational thing that's going to happen to the residential solar industry in the next two years is solar is going to no longer be an accessory. It's going to be a mandate. And if you're buying an EV, solar is going to be the tail behind that big dog. Yeah, that is really interesting. There's so many great points that you made about how, you know, basically solar is going to be the big dog if someone wants an EV. I think it's interesting too that LG is basically shepherding the whole process instead of handing off that lead to the installer, because it's really like the LG name is why the residential customer is having confidence. And they might not necessarily know anything or have very little information about the residential installer and how you're not competing with them if the lead comes through and they've been talking to you know someone who's basically part of the concierge program. So there's a lot of interesting points that you made. We really are trying to craft something that adds value to every stakeholder. I mentioned that from a project development standpoint. I truly believe this too. We need to offer value to the consumers. And we have to offer value to our installer partners. Our installers are our customers. They're the core of our business. And we will never do anything that deliberately interrupts their business or competes with them. Hi, this is Benoit, your host of the Solar Maverick Podcast. I would like to thank Summit Ridge Energy for sponsoring this episode of this podcast. Summit Ridge Energy is the leading owner and operator of community solar projects in the United States. The team has been a strong force within the U.S. commercial solar market for years and was instrumental in the creation of virtual power purchase agreements and associated financing structures. Summit Ridge Energy has leveraged this experience to launch Summit Ridge Capital, a dedicated funding platform that acquires pre-operational community solar and battery storage projects. SRE also works with landowners across the country to maximize the value of their acreage by offering predictable lease income to host their solar farms. From site identification and system design to take out financing to construction management, Summit Ridge Energy is the most complete solution provider in the community solar space. Summit Ridge Energy was interviewed twice on the Solar Maverick podcast. Definitely check out those episodes. The latest one was episode 87, how Summit Ridge Energy became one of the largest owners of community solar project in the U.S. That was with Steve Rader, who's the CEO of the company, and Brian Dunn, who holds a dual role of CEO, CFO for Summit Ridge Energy, and they're both founders of the company. And then there was an earlier interview, episode 26, a developer's perspective on the U.S. solar market with Steve Rader, who again is the CEO and founder of Summit Ridge Energy. If you want to learn more about Summit Ridge Energy, you could check them out at their website, which is srenergy.com or info at srenergy.com. We'll be also having in the notes of the podcast details about our sponsor. Thank you again to Summit Ridge Energy for sponsoring this episode of the Solar Maverick Podcast. Definitely, that's huge. That creates like that loyalty, as you said, and which is key. That is really interesting. And it's interesting too, because you talked about, you know, EVs and basically every rooftop that an EV customer can have solar, then, you know, solar is just almost mandatory. Can you talk about more about how the electrification of the transportation fleet is increasing the amount of solar adoption? Yeah, so we're recording this in the beginning of June and a couple of weeks prior to the recording of this, Sunrun and Ford made their big announcement about Sunrun becoming the solar fulfillment partner for Ford for their F-150 Lightning launch. And I think this is going to be the first announcement of several. Every auto manufacturer is thinking about this because if I'm an auto manufacturer, I haven't personally done this research, but I think it passes the intuition test. My cars going forward will never be internal combustion engine cars. They will be EVs. As I think about what does that mean for me? It means, well, I have range anxiety. So this is where I live in New York, have sufficient EV charging capacity on the highways that I drive on. I trust that the infrastructure will be built to support that. And then there's this idea of home charging. Now, we have the cost of home charging, but we also have the infrastructure. I need to get a level two installed in my garage or a couple of them. And so what does that mean? What sort of electrical upgrades are going to be required in my house? And now you start thinking about the cost component. It's the cost to install this, but now the cost to actually fuel my vehicles. 
I work from home, so I don't drive that much, but I do drive by gas stations pretty frequently. And this idea of periodically every couple of weeks, you have to stop and fill up your car with gasoline. That's now going to be every night I need to plug it in. Your home, your roof becomes your fuel station if you invest in solar. You're basically pre-buying that electricity. This is going to have a very interesting effect, right? So there's the energy storage dynamic of if you're in a place like California with a time of use rate or even demand charges, the energy storage can arbitrage that. Most people think about energy storage as a resiliency play. To me, that's secondary to the true value that energy storage can offer. But with EVs, once we start allowing bidirectional charging and vehicle to grid, you're going to have this fundamental change where consumers, excuse me, not consumers, but buyers of energy on the retail level won't just be able to buy it, they can actually sell back. And this, I think, is phenomenal. And we just watched the fight play out in California over the net metering 3.0, defeated. Congratulations to the California Solar and Energy Storage Association for that great victory on behalf of the entire industry. But this idea of the energy market is going to be a dynamic market. And there's been numerous studies that have been published about this. There is benefit to all energy market participants the more you put these distributed assets out there. So now you're doing substation referral. You're doing virtual power plants and distributed energy resource management. All those things are great acronyms that are buzzwords today, but when you actually start deploying tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of energy storage systems, whether they're stationary or mobile, now they become very, very impactful to the way that we not just consume energy, but interact with the energy markets. This doesn't mean that as a homeowner, you're going to start doing wholesale trading on your ISO, but syndicating this, and this is a huge business opportunity for the solar industry, really working with customers We're going to deliver you the power cost efficiently that you need and any excess power we're going to sell back and we're going to arbitrage on your behalf. It's just exciting to think about. Yeah, definitely. You know, we're all thinking about it. I think as well, like software will come into play to take advantage of the battery and when to, you know, dispatch into the grid to take advantage of, you know, time of use rates, as you mentioned. So it'll be interesting to see going forward. But I make very few declarative statements. But if you're in the solar industry today in 2021, if you're not thinking about how your business evolves to this inflection point that will happen in the next four or five years, you're going to miss a very huge. Think about it. Whether you're a small installer in a local market, a large OEM manufacturer, this should be a fundamental part of your five-year plan. Definitely. That is huge. And I appreciate you reiterating that point because we obviously have a lot of industry people listening to this. And I think that's something that we all should be paying attention about these changes that are happening faster than we could imagine, I think. And one thing that I thought was really interesting, you mentioned about how most solar projects in our pre-interview have 8% underperformance based on DNVGL report. Why is that the case and how can we fix the industry? You also actually wrote a PV Magazine article about this, which I'll provide the link as well, which I think is really helpful for the industry to understand because I don't think we really talk about this. So it was interesting to hear your perspective about it. So I had tip to the team at KWH Analytics. They're the ones that I think raise the industry's attention to this. Again, it's one of those instinctual things. If you're an industry participant, you read that headline and you go, eh, not that surprising. I'm just wired to look beyond that, though. I don't just accept it. I want to understand why. And I explore this in the PV Mag article, and I think it's, it is worthwhile for everyone to read. But I really broke it down into these three segments here. We have the developers. But no, you're a developer. I've developed projects. We have a personal interest to conflate the energy production values of the systems that we're developing because that increases our developer margin and fee. Now, we flip, as a developer, you flip it to an EPC who's responsible to build the project. Typically, the EPC is doing component selection based on an approved vendor list from the ultimate funder or the ultimate owner. And that typically looks very similar to like the BNEF tier one list, (laughs) which is fine. There's nothing wrong with the BNEF tier one list. But if you look into what that list is, it's not a marker of quality or even financial health. And so now the EPC is trying to build this project using an approved vendor list at the lowest possible cost. Because right? that's how they make their margin. No fault here. And so you have overly aggressive production assumptions coupled with someone who's trying to build the cheapest possible system. And you're, of course, going to have inherent issues. And so I mentioned two of the factors there. One is who's actually checking the modeling being done and the assumptions. So I mentioned at the beginning of the interview, I had a business that was inspecting and repairing underperforming solar assets. And it was almost comical, the things that I saw. I mean, comical if you have a six sense of humor, I guess. But you know, typically, at the end of a six-year flip, an investor is going to acquire a project. And they're going to look and see, hey, the project is not performing to model. 
first was trying to flip it, was trying to flip it at a higher value. So they would hire a consultant, whether it was me or CEA or DMB or one of these IEs to go out and look at it. And there were things, just poor modeling assumptions on shading, on soiling rates, you know, modules facing a different azimuth than was put in the original TV system. It's really incredible. So you have that element. And we really, as an industry, need to grow up with this stuff. We need to have validated good data. If you're a modeler or you're involved in energy modeling, your default, whatever tool you're using, is a 0.5% degradation rate. And I can tell you that is wrong 99% of the time. Either the degradation rate is higher or it's lower. And most people use that stock E rate. And there's very good reasons that we should have learned in our physics classes in high school or college, which I admittedly sucked through most of them. You know, the N type cell architecture, for example, of LG has a lower degradation rate than a P type perk. We have to model that correctly. Because if you don't model it correctly, you're going to have a bad model. And that brings me to the next point is the EPCs. EPCs are using lowest cost components wherever possible. Again, don't fault them for that. But this has created an awareness of the subcomponents used to make modules. Modules, if you're an investor looking at Excel all day, a solar panel is a commodity that's a big rectangle. And they're dumb devices. They're just giant semiconductors that don't move. Anyone can mass produce these things relatively inexpensively and easily. But what JBox are they using? What connectors are they using? And what bag are they using? Now we're starting to see these failure rates. And this is where the factory audits and material traceability is, is super important. It's not a silver bullet to solve the issue, but it can create a greater awareness of what you're actually buying. And again, having done any number of factory audits and, and being in some of these places, it's astounding. And if anyone walked into half these factories... Who's actually making this product? There's so much tolling that goes on to circumvent the tariffs. You know, are you buying module X or are you buying module Y that was made on module X's line? And at the end, depending on the order you place, they're putting a sticker on it. That stuff happens in this industry. And we have to really track this and be more responsible at how our procurement or supply chain is working. And the final thing is O&M. There are better O&M protocols today than there were a couple of years ago. There's more companies, more sophisticated companies involved in it. But silly things like people walking on modules, whether they're doing EPC or O&M, they're causing more harm than good. And as an industry, we really have to recognize this, create good O&M protocols that people are adhering to on a contractual compliance basis, and don't skimp out on O&M. Your inverter will fail. It's, it's kind of a truism. But are you getting the full usable life out of it because you're doing proper servicing? Or are you having premature failures because you're not changing the filters and doing what the manufacturer recommends to get the optimized life out of that inverter? Yeah, I mean, those are so many great points. And I appreciate you walking through it. And it's just interesting because over time, I have been seeing like underperformance in the industry. And that's a huge issue that we have to, as an industry you know, talk about and figure out how to solve. And obviously you talked about a lot of the ways that that has happened. And it's interesting because when you always look at production forecasts from developers, as you said, it's always very rosy, but then to actually like implement it is something very different. And I laugh because of the 0.5% degradation. That's just like the industry's assumption going forward over 25 to 35 years, which the modeling of it is so key. And obviously, you know, EPC and the parts that you're using in O&M is a huge part of it because people try to... You have asset managers, asset owners skimping on O&M to save money, but that impacts like the economics of the project. And it's interesting because I've seen issues come up because of the O&M packages that the investors... Yeah, you know, if I'm a developer of Benoit and I'm saying, hey, people have accepted this very aggressive model and the EPC built it as cheap as possible and I have no performance obligation and I made a great buck on this, I think that comes to an end sooner or later because it's the same pot of tax equity investors. It's the same pool of investors in the industry. And the more they realize that their assets are underperforming, the more they're going to price the risk cost of capital into these projects. It becomes self-defeating in the long run. You can't play this game forever as an industry. We really need to address this. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm seeing that as a big thing. Like when investors are looking at projects, they're automatically haircutting by 5%, like the production estimates. Or when you immediately execute the LOI between the developer and investor, the investor has an independent engineer verify or come up with production estimates. Obviously, that like changes the economics of what the development fee could be, especially obviously if it's lower or higher, but usually it's lower. So it's interesting that you mentioned that. But no, it goes back to that comment I made now. This is the third time. If you do a deal and everyone in the deal makes what they expect to make or better and you form a good team, you don't create these adversarial relationships between team members. 
develop quality projects, build it using quality materials, service them in a way that's contractually compliant. These projects will generate great revenues and the investors will be happy. They'll come back to you every time. And that next time they get an IE involved and you can use real world data to say, I know what I'm doing. This project performed as expected or slightly better. You don't instantly start those fights between IEs, which are very expensive for both parties because everyone has an interest to protect their respective interests. Form teams, do good work, great things will happen. That's so true. And that's the trust and the scalability of like once the partners are trusted and loyal to each other, then that creates scalability. Always the first deal, I feel like, is the hardest. That's right. <laughs> so you actually mentioned this a little bit before generally, but it would be great if you could go into more of like why energy density is important. And you talked earlier about this in the podcast, but I think it's very important for people to know because like it is analysis between cost and then, you know, production of the panel that's usually like done by developers and investors. So it'd be great to get your perspective on that. When we look back at this period of history for solar, there'll be a few things, right? COVID, supply chain. But the interesting thing that we've seen is this trend towards what I've coined the term of BAMs, big ass modules. You know, these BAMs, these 600 watt modules aren't more efficient. They're just bigger. And bigger is fine in certain applications. If you're installing a fixed tilt in a desert with low wind, which in deserts you rarely have, but let's say, you know, the geographic constraints can support it, you know, those 600, 650 watt modules can offer really inherent advantages from an installation efficiency and reduction of bounce of system usage. But the problem is, is people confuse this idea of a 650 watt module as being more efficient than an energy dense 450. And there are clear applications where one is better than the other. And this is where this idea of going beyond the superficial data on the data sheet becomes materially important. The United States is big. We have a lot of different weather patterns, geographic considerations, seismic, wind. And I'm thinking about these BAMs on the trackers. You're hearing from the tracker people that they're developing trackers that can support and fit these very large modules. But what are you doing to the motors, the actuators on these trackers? What's going to happen from an O&M perspective? What is that high cost of those big modules? In solar, it's all about efficiency. Efficiency will always win at the end of the day. But the question is, what is the cost of that efficiency? And I think this is where good economic modeling becomes materially important. It goes back to my prior point. And by the way, for the listeners, we didn't pre-plan this kind of line of conversation, but using accurate modeling, looking at real D rates, understanding the actual performance modules over time to get to as accurate a possible number in 20 or 25 years, whatever your end of life system is, was going to make you a better, smarter, developer that can maximize the value of what you're developing or building for that matter. You know, LG makes N-type and back contact modules. These are inherently energy efficient and low degradation. We are running around trying to do gigawatt deals in for interconnection in the Cal ISO. We understand the economics there. And if you want to buy the modules because it makes sense, happy to sell them to you. My content information will appear in the show notes, but understand that there's a premium for this product. But if you're building a carport that's very expensive to build, or you're building a residential rooftop application that's space constrained, these products have inherent advantages if you model them correctly. Don't be distracted by someone coming out with a 500 watt module if it's physically large because you're not able to fit more panels up there. Your DC capacity doesn't always go up. Sometimes it does, you know, no hard and fast rules on this, but you really have to look at the individual projects and make the right decision for the individual project. The residential, just to talk about that for a second, this is value and standardization. I get that. What module, what balance of system is going to work the vast majority of times? Standardize on that, become really, really good experts at installing that, get value from your manufacturing and distributing partners for buying higher volumes. Those bigger modules don't always work. Higher efficiency modules don't always work too. Know your market, know what works in your market. I appreciate you providing like the example so that people could have a better idea of what they should look for. You know, obviously, like in the beginning of the podcast, we talked about COVID. Can you talk about how the industry has changed because of COVID and what does that mean for solar? But I think there's so many ways to answer this question. So we talked a little bit about what LG did post-COVID. We did the market research. We stood up the concierge program. I think from a residential perspective, we were inherently inefficient with the way we we're doing customer acquisition. You don't have to sit at a customer's kitchen table to get them to sign a deal. Now, sometimes that works. Sometimes that is the right thing for your market, especially early adoption markets. Being in person, showing them that you're a real person that they can know and trust, working for a real company has value. I'm not going to dismiss that value. But can you do your pre-meetings online? Can you use these these great tools that have been set up, some which are now free for like 3D modeling on rooftops and getting really accurate shade analysis. 
when I put solar on my roof, stood up there with the sun eye to get the shade analysis. You don't have to do that anymore. There's clearly efficiencies that have been generated on the residential side through COVID. I think something else is we've learned from an infrastructure standpoint that cities evolve, transmission nodes evolve. What was right in 2019 with a lot of like office capacity, maybe manufacturing capacity in 2020 was wrong as people shifted to more remote work and people became very sensitive to the fact that they were buying a lot of power at their home and thinking about ways to solve for that. Now, hopefully we don't have another pandemic for another hundred years, but what else will happen? Earthquakes, hurricanes. I mean, there's always events that happen where utilities need to start thinking about developing flexible infrastructure. The answer to that question is energy storage. Energy storage today is getting to a point where it's cost efficient and then it allows utilities to create this dispatchable power, especially as there's greater saturation for distributed generating assets in order to move that electricity where you need to at the most valuable time. Energy storage is the answer to that question. And I think the other big thing, and I'd be remiss to, to not talk about this as it relates to COVID, is every American became hyper aware to our PPE, personal protective equipment supply chain in 2020. We don't make this stuff in the US. And I'm a volunteer firefighter in EMT, and I needed them in 95. I needed gloves. I needed the masks. And in March and April last year, you couldn't get them because they were all made in China. And China was self-consuming these things. I don't fault them for it. And it created this awareness that what are we actually making in the U.S.? Now, PP is one thing that, that was life and death for some people. But from a solar perspective, I think we're also awakening to our supply chain. The reality is 96% of ingots, you don't know what an ingot is. It's the step in between polysilicon and wafers, but you have to have an ingot to make a solar module is made in China. 92% of wafers are made in China. And as we've seen these reports coming out of Western China and Xinjiang, which by the way, I couldn't pronounce prior to like November of last year. And now I say it multiple times a day. It's created this awareness that what's actually going on in our upstream supply chain in this industry. Is there a high cost of these cheap components that we've been relying on. Now, LG doesn't manufacture solar modules in China. We manufacture them in the US, South Korea, but our upstream suppliers are in China. And you read these reports, the US's label is going on there as genocide. You're questioning, am I using components in this? Am I economically complicit in what's going on? There's no good answer because you can't really validate what's going on in these sub-tier suppliers. And two, there's a clear consequence to the industry. You can't just turn the spigot off from products from China because there's no viable alternative at the moment. But there's also this economic consequence of, as a developer, you're citing projects two, three, four years out based on economic assumptions that if you don't have access to low-cost product, those products don't get built. And the Biden administration has a very clear agenda to deploy more solar. But at what cost? At what capital cost and what human cost? And I think this is something that the industry is now grappling with. I'm seeing more and more requests from customers asking for supplier audits. I appreciate that people are now taking this seriously. And whether it was a cracked back sheet, a melting connector, or a question of where your polysilicon is coming from, the industry is no longer treating every solar modules the same. They're not just dumb rectangles on rooftops. These are components made by people that use a supply chain that's global in nature, and we should understand where our components are coming from. Everyone in the solar industry, whether you're a residential installer installing a system a week or a mega developer installing a gigawatt a year, you need to ask these questions and think about it because it's not okay to say, I accept the word of somebody who maybe has an interest to lie to me. And we need to really validate what's going on in our supply chain, and we should not be economically complicit in something that is potentially, we don't want to be on the wrong side of history on this one. Yeah, definitely. I appreciate you bringing up this issue. I mean, it's something that as an industry, you know, it impacts us all and we should understand what the human cost is and obviously the economic cost as well. And I think not many people in the industry are talking about it as much as it should be talked. I think people are talking about it. They're just not clearly talking loudly about it because it's kind of the industry's dirty secret. We don't want to slow down adoption of solar because consumers are worried about this, understandably. I think consumers should be worried about it. Utilities should be worried about it. The administration is clearly worried about it. And this will all come to a head here sooner or later. Maybe by the time this airs, we'll have a customs and border protection ruling on an enforcement scope and clause. Until that happens, though, everything is at risk. And project development, manufacturing, all of us in the solar industry, we don't need risk. And at our core, the takeaway is we need to diversify away from this risk. These are all really good points. And this was a great interview, Brian. I appreciate you being on the podcast. I also appreciate you listening to the podcast as well. I know you think about running because you're usually <laughs> listening to podcasts. So. <laughs> 
Yeah, but no, I really appreciate you having me on. It's a fun thing to do. I enjoy speaking about solar. It also shields my wife from me talking about the solar industry from her for at least another hour. So I'm sure she appreciates it. I listen to all the solar. I consume solar media when I run. It's a way for me to think about work and think about the industry, but also kind of zone out. And I would encourage people, whether you're just getting in the industry or you've been in it for longer than me, continue to learn, continue to educate yourself. I'm not the smartest person in solar. If I said something of value to you today, I appreciate that. Please reciprocate. Reach out to me on LinkedIn. Email me. Call me. Whatever you need to do. Let's learn from each other. We're still in a relative infancy in this industry. And we'll make ourselves smarter and better. No one has all the answers. I certainly don't. And I really appreciate this opportunity, Benoit, to speak to your audience. And I appreciate the podcast that you do. Some great content. I've learned a lot listening to people. I've networked with some of your guests based on what they've said. And you do offer a great service to this industry. So I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate you sharing your insights. Like I learned so much from these interviews and, you know, I hear a lot from audience members and definitely like there was so much value that you added. I'm really happy that you came on. And I know you mentioned like the best way to connect with you is on LinkedIn. If our listeners wanted to learn more about LG and you, is LinkedIn the best way? to connect or send me a DM on LinkedIn. I'm not active on Twitter for like philosophical reasons. I've been in that platform a few years ago. So LinkedIn is the best place to do it. I do contribute to PV Magazine, as we've mentioned a couple of times. And I typically repost those articles on LinkedIn. I do some thought leadership stuff on LinkedIn. So if you're interested in what I've said, Brian Lynch at LG, I will say there's another Brian Lynch in the industry. I actually share the same middle name. So we occasionally get our wires crossed. He's in my phone as the other because it confuses me too. So if I say something that angers you or you think is wrong, I'm Brian Lynch at Redwood Energy. You should connect with that Brian Lynch and clearly express your concerns about things that were said on this podcast. LinkedIn is the best place to get me. My email address is my first name, Brian, B-R-I-A-N dot Lynch, L-Y-N-C-H at L-G-E dot com. You're welcome to send me an email. We have a pretty robust spam filter, so it might take me a little while to get to it if you haven't been whitelisted, but I will reply. And I really appreciate connecting and growing my network in the solar industry. I like building teams. I like building projects. And I like seeing this industry continue to evolve and advance. It's a ton of fun. Yeah, definitely. And your LinkedIn and your email and the PV Magazine links will be on the notes of the podcast. And thank you again, Brian. This was really helpful. Thanks, Benoit. I had a lot of fun. Thanks for listening to the Solar Maverick Podcast. The Solar Maverick Podcast is brought to you by Renew Energy. We're a solar development and consulting firm. If you believe that this podcast is adding value to you, please give us a five-star review and share with those that you think could benefit from this information. Please email all questions, suggestions, and feedback to info at renewenergy.com. That's I-N-F-O at R-E-N-E-U energy.com. The Solar Maverick Podcast is produced by Podcast Laundry and executive produced by Benoit Thangin and Kevin Y. Brown. 